basins? Big question. We're going to do the obvious ones first. Why do you need a spacesuit? Because you'll die. That's a huge motivator. And motivations like that is, okay, if they open up the door and it's like, oops, I knew I forgot something. Okay, but why? To monitor and regulate your mm -hmm. bodily functions. Mm -hmm. To protect in case of a fire, like in Power One. That's why they wear the spacesuits all the time now. Well, they were in their suits when they died. They didn't have the, um, yeah, they did. Okay. Yeah, okay. it burned through. At which, which I, I didn't even think that uh, uh, about the new construction of them. They're very fireproof now. But anyway, there's no oxygen. Out of all the elements in the periodic table, oxygen is my friend. Give me a bottle of it, I'll, dr I'll breathe it forever. Oxygen is a good thing. Space, there's no oxygen. But more importantly, and this is one of the key things about a spacesuit, is that you need pressure. That's one of the most fundamental reasons why you have a suit. Terrible things, it's bad enough without oxygen. Trust me. No. <coughs> Try holding your breath more than a few minutes. You get real familiar with how much you really like oxygen. Actually, you know that your, oh my God, I have to breathe, is really because your carbon dioxide level goes up. It's not because you don't have oxygen. Many people have died in a room where a ton of nitrogen was let loose, perfectly able to breathe, get the carbon dioxide out, next thing you know, gone. You need oxygen, but you need that pressure. We're gonna talk a little bit about the physiology, and then we're gonna talk about the suits themselves and how they address that. So, yeah. No air pressure, no, it's a vacuum. Well, gee, isn't that pretty surprising? I told you you'd learn something today. I love it when the smart people are here. Get in the front road, I get heckled. I love this. It's a shame Jules isn't here. There's a gentleman here who's like smarter than all of us combined. And he always has a great way of like anticipating my next slide. He asks a question. He's, he's my, my favorite straight man. Uh, and it was like, well, Frank, what about whatever? Answer. He's creepy like that. I mean, he's just amazing. So, smart people. We're under pressure. Now, it's not that your boss is giving you lots of heat, but we're under a tremendous amount of pressure. How much pressure? Any idea? Air pressure. Think of this. Pounds per square inch. Can't hear again. 32 pounds per square inch. Anyone else have a thought? 18 pounds per square inch. 14.7. We'll say a thousand millibars. Yeah, one bar is one atmosphere. So, any idea we're really, I mean, okay, we have a round number, 14.7 PSI. Any idea really what that's like? What's a good intuitive way of expressing the pressure that's on the human body? How much does a gallon of water weigh? Give or take. I just found out that milk is eight pounds, but yeah. Okay. Take two gallons, a little less than two gallons, maybe seven quarts. Get your water bottles. Put it on a square inch of your skin. That's the pressure air is doing and squeezing us. You don't feel it because we've evolved that, okay, fine, that works, but that's real honest to God pressure. That's what we need to live. So, pressure is fun. You want pressure. What happens when you don't have pressure? Start going up, start to go up to Mount Everest. Strange things happen, or it's strange if you're not intuitive into this. You have a problem with water. As you go up, as you go into lower and lower pressure, the temperature water boils goes down. And that's real honest to God boiling. You get to the top of Mount Everest, it's 160 degrees. Water boils at 212 Fahrenheit. Well, that's a lot of nothing. Uh, that's a bit of a problem. You 
get a little bit higher, 60,000 feet, you hit a particular limit. That's not Neil Armstrong, that's a different Armstrong. <laughs> but you hit a limit, you can't even survive for a little bit different reason. We're going to talk about that. 60,000 feet, that's way higher than any airliner. But once you get to that, if you open the door, it's goodbye, Irene. Good night. I'm not going to go around with the explanation, but at that altitude, why doesn't your blood boil? That's a great one of those left as an exercise to the reader. As you get higher up, water boils at room temperature. That's not a good thing. Get higher and higher. Say you're in a vacuum chamber, and this has happened twice, I believe. Guys testing out a spacesuit, something happens, the hose breaks. How long do you think you have to survive? 90 seconds. About 90 seconds. We'll call it a minute, but yeah. What's the last conscious uh, thought that you're going to experience when all of a sudden all your air pressure goes away? That's really bizarre. If you think of it, I'd be surprised, but it's really bizarre. My eyes are dried out, my ears hurt. Oh boy, oh, you, you certainly blow out your eardrum, sure, yeah. The last sensation that you have is that all the liquid in your mouth is boiling. Room temperature boiling. Remember, 80,000 feet, if you're in a vacuum, of course, that's way higher. Last sensation you have before you lose consciousness is all the fluids, your eyes, and all the rest. So this is considered a bad day at work. A very bad day. Now, altitude. I've lived all over the country. This always throws people. If you go up to Denver, if you go up to a lot higher things you want to cook, you always have to adjust your recipes. That's standard thing. I mean, they even have a, there's even a cookbook to adjust things. This is serious stuff. This isn't crazy talk. And yeah, you can survive. I'm sorry, 2001 is like one of my favorite movies. Everyone goes, oh, you can't survive in space. I don't know if anyone, how many people have seen it, but this is one of the great dramatic scenes. That actually can be done. True fact. If it took a little bit longer for that door to close, yeah, he would have been a goner. Certainly, his, uh, you know, all the fluids in his mouth would be bubbling. You certainly can't hold your breath. But yeah, you can survive. Maybe a minute. But we want to be a little more productive than that. Yes, sir? If you exhale completely, you can last for a minute, right? Round numbers. I, I wouldn't want to sit there with a stopwatch and try to break that record. I learned that from uh, Hitchcock Sky to the Galaxy. That's a, well, that's a good source. In the book, he said, well, uh, Arthur Dent was out in space. And, yeah. And, and then they have to engage the infinite and probability drive. to go. Yeah. seconds, they, they, yeah. uh, part of gold saves if you, if you don't know Hitchhiker's Guide, we're gonna, we could do a whole talk on it. Anyway, but yeah, you can survive, but those last few seconds, you're not real productive. So, we're going to get back to that pressure. Now, yeah, I, I love oxygen as much as anyone else. Again, give me a couple bottles of the stuff. I'll breathe it forever. But you need pressure. And why do you need pressure? You have to have, when you go into the lungs, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> this is, this is. You need pressure for your circulatory system. Yeah. You know, it, the avioli in the lungs, those are some pretty strict, you know, stiff barriers. You have to have pressure to push the oxygen into the blood. If you don't have enough, there's no oxygen. It could be 100% oxygen and it doesn't matter. You need to have that pressure. Remember that gallon and a half of water on every square inch? That's in your lungs, that's all over your body. You have to have pressure to force the oxygen into the alveoli of your lungs in order to breathe. One of those physiology things, been known for 100 years. So, oh, I'll just get a mask. 
They tried that. They tried that. Actually, this is all dating back to like the 1930s. We're going to go back all that way, believe it or not. You put a mask on, you know, regular like fighter pilot oxygen mask. You try pumping that up to a couple pounds of pressure. You know what happens? It just blows out. You can't, if you could get a mask on that airtight, it's going to be a tough, tough day at work. So, you got to seal yourself in. They tried. Now, again, now we're starting to get up kind of high. This is the 1930s now. I want to start doing altitude records. Above 35,000 feet, it gets tough. 40,000, of course, you can't survive. I need that pressure. We have to have some sort of pressure suit. Isn't engineering great? They come up with these really obvious things. I need a pressure suit. Pressure. So, just a quickie thing here, sea level. By the time you get to 35,000 feet, you have half the oxygen. That's not enough to keep you going. Even, you know, again, maybe a minute-ish. But if you have pure oxygen at that level, you're going to survive. Here you have the amount of oxygen, you still need that pressure. That's a hard limit. So, Wiley Post, crazy man. Absolutely nuts. Lost his eye in an accident and then decided that, oh, well, I can only see in one eye, therefore I go into aviation. You can't make this stuff up if you try. That was his solution, 1935. And it was about as functional as you could imagine. It worked. That's about all you can say. It worked. He was alive when he went up. He was alive when he got down. That was it. But you could imagine in that kind of thing, with that kind of pressure, and that, that helmet, yeah, you could be a really functional fighter pilot looking for bad guys out of that. Yeah, right. It kept him alive. We were happy with that. The basic idea was 100% perfectly sound. Totally impractical, but it worked. So we need our pressure. We need our oxygen. Two ways of doing this. One of them is real, real obvious. Put yourself in a big bag, pressurize it. You could be there all day. A few little problems with that. In fact, there are so many problems. <clears throat> there were so many problems. The solution wasn't real obvious, wasn't real easy. But remember, we're comfortable. We're used to the whole idea of having lots of pressure from a gas, this atmosphere thingy that we've grown kind of used to. <clears throat> Do I need a gas expressing that pressure on me? What about mechanical? Why can't I just squeeze myself? Well, that's pretty neat. They came up with what was called a counter-pressure suit. And this, when you take a look, especially at the, uh, 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 the images and photographs and all the rest, newsreels of the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, this is what you saw. I'm in a bodysuit. If I'm in need of having pressure on me, I can go and have something squeeze me real tight. That's the exact same thing. I still have a little bit of a problem that I'm not having that pressure going into my lungs. So I do have to have some sort of way of pressurizing my head to get the oxygen into the lungs and for the rest of the body, keeping it from expanding. The human body in a vacuum will expand to about twice its size. We're not going to say how much fun that is. So, if I could have a clever way of ex exerting all this pressure all over my body, then, and we're just going to zip up, then that's not going to happen. This is actually what we're going to be talking about. You need to have that pressure so that that liquid in your body doesn't boil. Believe it or not, your skin is very airtight. Not perfectly, but it's pretty good. Yes, your blood wouldn't boil. Would it? 
That was that question. We'll talk about that in a bit. It's a, uh, it won't boil when you're alive. If you're dead, it'll eventually. And it doesn't boil, it actually sublimates and all the rest. So, Wiley. <coughs> so, let's go to the ones that are easy, the ones that are obvious. We're talking a full pressure suit, pretty much what you think of as a standard spacesuit. It's an airtight bag with full of gas and uh, full of pressure. At three and a half pounds per square inch, 100% oxygen, we can talk, you know, we're not going to get into the heavy duty math and all this. There's a concept called partial pressure. At sea level, 21% oxygen. Turns out it's the same amount of oxygen molecules at three and a half pounds, much higher up. That's getting up around 40,000 feet, 35, 40,000 feet. And 100% oxygen, same number of oxygen atoms, and just enough pressure to push it through the lungs into your blood. This is what we had on multiple spacecraft. We, you know, uh, it works. And you can do that for a long, long time. This is a solution. The only problem is when you have, oh, sir. That's what they went to after Apollo 1, wasn't it? Apollo 1 oh, okay. Uh, can we take that just a little offline? It's a much longer story. It's a very good story. Uh, the Apollo capsules were actually like 4.8 uh, pounds. Um, and I, in cutting this down, I took out issues with uh, 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 decompression sickness, nitrogen, and all the rest. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of information, which I'd love to talk to you offline. And I, it's useful, and I, I think I still have the old slides in here. From, uh, but I have to cut this down so we don't spend all day here. So, we get ourselves, this is 1940s-ish. We're trying to have pilots look for bad guys, go flying, bomb, whatever bad guys are out there. Airliners go 35,000. That's a real practical level. You know, how you can't go much further, but these guys want to go much higher. I got to have a, a, a suit. I have to have something to protect the human body. Well, let's see what we can do. We'll put ourselves in a big bag. Sir, Trivia question. Have you ever tried to bend a football? No. It's a shame. I, I, I was looking for old footballs so I could do this. You want the car. You want to go run out and see if you can bend it? Just kidding. We can do this later. You know how tough it is to bend a football? Pretty tough. Yes and no. God constrained the problem. If it's not inflated, how easy is it to bend the football? Pretty easy. I mean, just leather. Once you inflate, and I think you inflate a football to what? Six PSI? Something like that. You can't bend that thing to save your soul. Now you have this bag around you, inflated to about five PSI. How well do you think you can bend? Not real easy. This is the fundamental problem of early pressure suits. Not the mechanical ones, which we're going to talk about, because those were brilliant in their own silly way. But yeah, try to bend the football someday. I mean, in your spare time with a spare football. You were effectively, not quite, because they did do some great engineering, you were effectively immobilized. You were alive, which was the whole point of it. You want to be alive when you get down, or you're not going to be alive when you get down. But you're just... <laughs> Here's another silly problem. If I do a suit, a rubber suit, and these things were just terrible, again, by today's standards, and I go and get my, does anyone, ladies, you might remember simplicity patterns? My sisters always love to make their clothes and all the rest. Everyone remembers. So you get your simplicity pattern for a rubber suit and all the rest. We've all seen people with you know, rubber gloves and... Does that sound like a good thing? Turns out the early ones, the first thing that happened was that the, the neck ring, which is supposed to be here, everything stretched. It was up there. Not a good idea. I, I, there's some wonderful pictures of some poor guy, and all you see is the top of his head. It says, okay, well, that idea didn't work. Now, if you do a pattern of, of, you know, just basically outline you and arms and legs and all the rest, 
And now you're inflated like a football. Certain kind of problems come up. You know what it's like trying to sit down? I mean, you're a pilot, you sit. You know, on a fancy airliner, you have a sheepskin seat, and you can not maybe not recline, but I mean, that's your office. You sit all day, you drive airplanes. Being like this, I have to move the wheel of the port. No, that's not going to work too well. So, this is one of the early ones. This is actually one of the most practical ones, the ones that work real well. First off, why can't you bend a football? Increases. Yeah. It turns out if you put in like accordion pleats, like the guy has his elbows and knees, you maintain a constant volume. So as you bend it, again, I wish I'd brought it with me. Think of a bendy straw. Exact same thing. But you notice that the guy's kind of hunched over and it's not because it's heavy and he's got a lot of extra material in his trunk. Why? Because he's going to be flying. He's going to be sitting down. If you're going to be like frozen or close to frozen in position, you want to have your feet on the pedals and you know, at least have your arms out. This is what you're up against. This was the best they could do. And uh, this was actually used uh, in one of the very early flights on the X-15. It was lousy. Yes, ma'am. What's the material that it's made? Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more detail on that. But it's basically rubberized fabric. Now, this is before all the days when we had some really, really nice fabrics uh, like nylon and dracon and all the rest. Again, this is right after the uh, Second War. Um, it... Uh, some really amazing fabrics did come out of this. You know that meshy kind of link kind of stuff? I guess it was more popular in the 70s. Yes, I'm a child of the 70s. None of the selfs are going to admit that. Um, but that kind of like mesh, not lace, but mesh kind of... Oh, it seems to make that flutterware. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It turns out all that was invented to solve this problem. It was done by an amazing company called David Clark, who did, who did clothing, but they knew the human body. And an even better company that really knew the intricacies of the human body sent us to the moon. We'll talk about that. So that was it. So now, at least, you know, you have junk in your trunk or a lot of space. It worked. Did I skip one? No. So now we get into this mechanical suit. Now this was a great gas bag. I mean, it was lousy. It really wasn't that practical. With the helmet and all the rest, you could barely move. You think flying a fighter plane's gonna be easy with all the conniptions? You were lucky to get up and down. But it worked. You were alive when you, la when you launched. You, know, you were alive when you put the wheels of the plane back on the ground. So now we have this other way of doing it. We still have our problem is we need the pressure. And so we want to exert pressure all over your body, keeping the air pressure high for your lungs is a separate issue, which they addressed. But how do I clamp down on your body? I'm at sea level right now. I don't need to be you know, tourniqueted all over my body, but once I get up above 40,000, 50,000 feet, I'm going to really need that. How do you adjust that? How do you do that? You get a custom, basically a custom fit. They had a million different sizes. You know, something that, you know, I'm six feet tall, I weigh 200. You get another six foot tall, 200 pound person. They're probably two different sizes just because our body makeup is going to be different. And these were very close to being very custom made. And they had these, what's called, they called it a capsan. And if you're familiar with a capsan on a boat where you run ropes around, similar process. And you had tubes. We're going to look at a picture. The tubes went up your arms, up and down your sides. And in a sense, if you can imagine the tube getting pressurized and the tube expands, okay. And you wrap, a, wrap fabric around this, 
kind of like reversed. And so as it expands, it expresses tension on those fabric straps. Those fabric straps are connected to you, basically your bodysuit. And the best way of seeing this, this is the back view of it, and let's see if we can, I couldn't find any good pictures, but you had these tubes, and as they expand, it pulls these fabric tapes. Those tapes, now are getting tighter and tighter and tighter, kind of like a tourniquet. Real uncomfortable. And it's all the way from your neck, all the way to your, you know, down to your ankles. You don't have to worry about your hands or feet because you're in leather uh, uh, boots and that's going to inhibit any kind of pressure. Your feet will expand, but it's held by, you know, sturdy flying boots, all the rest. Gloves are a different problem. We'll talk about gloves. Gloves are the toughest thing in space flight. We'll talk about that. But you're hooked up. As you get higher up, the tubes get pressurized. You start getting cinched down. If you're familiar in aviation, fighter pilots, what's called an anti-G suit. Very similar concept where the idea is that as you're flying, you're pulling Gs, fighting a bad guy, you need to have your blood keep from going down from your brain because your brain really likes oxygen. And so it basically puts a tourniquet from down around uh, your calves all the way up to here, squeezes it, basically blocking off the circulation so that it doesn't leave the brain. Works very well, used today. This is a full body version of it. This was miserable, but it worked. And they used this for 20-something years, 25 years. You know, that one picture with the boiling water, that was effectively the front view of the suit. Very carefully. I mean, if it was so, uh, loose and baggy, so you could actually wear it comfortably, it wasn't going to tighten up enough and you'd lose all your function way up high. So, and by the way, they're only really good up to about 80,000 feet. Uh, if you're going into space, it's a little higher. I hear the moon's a lot further. I have that on good technical authority. So, they're finally getting that baggy suit that you saw. Oh, okay, I'm on time. Um, that baggy suit you saw, a little bit more refined. They figured out, okay, just like blowing up a, a rubber glove and it just expands everywhere, well, we need to find ways of restraining that. We can't have it blow up and then all of a sudden your helmet's like way up here and you're looking at the inside, all the rest. Turns out that's real interesting engineering, material science, all kinds of great things. How do you maintain flexibility? How do you make a flexible football that you can bend at pressure? Ooh, when you think of it, engineering, that's kind of a neat idea, a neat thing to start working on. But you're in a rubber suit. Have you ever been in the tropics? I, I, I'm not going to, this actually sounds a little kinky. But have you ever been in the tropics in a rubber suit? Or maybe like a dry suit? You know, a diving suit? I've been in wetsuits more than a few times. They're the most uncomfortable thing on earth when it gets warm. Now, think of sitting there in your plane, pulling alert for hours on end. You end up just drenched in your own juices. It is miserable. And then, of course, your effectiveness goes down because now you're dehydrated, you're overheated. It is a bad way of spending the day. But this was, this was what they had. At least they were getting more flexible. You weren't frozen in, spl frozen in uh, place by the pressure. They were getting more flexible. And they're actually getting pretty functional. Time and time again, the big issue, overheating. Every single time. These guys come out just dripping wet, miserable. Remember I was telling you that one spacesuit? And it was designed for pilots to sit like this. Because if it was like this, it wouldn't be very... We all know this picture, Ed White. You notice he's in a sitting posture? That's exactly why. It was designed so that he wouldn't sit there and go like this. In the spacecraft, when it pressurized... It pressurized him in a nice, comfortable seated position. That's actually the, the natural, the natural uh, 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 
expansion of it. But the clever ways they had to keep like the helmet from going way above his head and all the rest, it was all done with pulleys and, and wire ropes and all the rest just to hold everything together. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the natural inflated state for these kind of spacesuits. Sir? I'm sorry, on the previous slide, not to go back, but you said that it doesn't have to be air, but doesn't, isn't 20% of your breathing through your skin? No. Okay. Skin is roughly airtight. It's not completely. I mean, obviously, it's porous. You sweat through it, all the rest. But on the whole, if you could, if you had, if you could put that pressure on, and say we're using, again, like a, 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 a light mesh or something that's obviously very porous, uh, you would survive. That's actually what these guys did. Those counter pressure suits, the one exerting pressure, were not airtight. They were hot and uncomfortable just because they were, you know, close to your skin and lots of material, but they weren't, the, the big requirement wasn't that they had to be absolutely airtight. Okay, but isn't like if you get tarred and feathered, don't you suffocate? There's a better example, but, and it's an internet mem. Okay, now we're going to, okay, sorry. now we're getting way off the track here, but this is a good one. Back to the thing. How many people like James Bond? How can you not like James Bond, right? Golden Girl thing, the, goal, the, the Golden Girl. And the question was, uh, uh, yeah, when they painted her up gold, Goldfinger, uh, yeah, she was close to death because you know, her skin, one of the arguments was you breathe through your skin. You don't. But it was also a pretty good insulator. And remember, they're doing all this in the tropics. And she was getting very sick from heat exhaustion is what it was. I think that's actually in, on, the, on, on the Snopes.com site. Don't quote me on that, but I think it is. But uh, it was not good. But it wasn't because, yeah, you know, she was certainly able to breathe. But again, uh, there's better ways of going. Who was that? Ursula? It wasn't Ursula Andress, was it? I have to get caught up in my bond. I'm sorry? Who's got a phone? Who can look that up? Isn't the internet a beautiful thing? Yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide, right there, done. Anyway, so, we're heading to the moon. It's going to look kind of awkward if everyone has to walk like this on the surface. That's not good at all. Here's a question for you to the studio audience. All the other spaces we've seen were all done by either Goodrich, you know, the tire company now. Goodrich actually had a big aerospace division. Uh, actually, they still do. Think of a company that really pretty well knows the human body. They're the ones who designed this. It's actually down in um, Delaware. We'll just work our way through. Who really knows how to make clothing that contours real well to the skin? Anyone else? Make ski outfits. Well, if you look at what skiing was like in the 60s compared to today, uh, yes, nowadays, yeah. But... Uh, Underwear companies. Keep going. Okay. Company name. Of course, all the companies today didn't exist in the 60s. You know who designed and has probably, I mean, it was just a brilliant design, the spacesuits to land on the moon? Yeah. Oh, I don't even think they were around even 20 years ago, were they? Playtex, bras and girdles. Uh, International Playtex company. Cross your heart, cross your heart suit. Yeah, <laughs> that was done by a bra manufacturer down in Delaware. And... It was a fabulous, they knew how to cut fabric right. And they didn't do the backpack, but International Playtex did, you know, again, one assembly line, you know, cross your heart, the other one, spacesuits. Makes sense to me. Think of that, makes sense. 
This is, then we think of like uh, the astronauts who walk on the moon, was now a big white moon suit and all the rest. This was actually the pressure suit. And remember on that one horrible looking one with all those, almost like a tomato worm kind of convolutes, all the rest, you see that's there on the arms. You don't see it because of the fabric, but that's also on the arms and legs. Now you think of like, again, think of bendy straws. That works great, but I can pull a bendy straw, right? So everything is restrained. And the whole idea is how to make everything bend so you have a constant volume, which makes it easier, but it's not constraining. Afterward, and I, is that the next slide? No. Afterwards, we put on a thermal protection, micrometeoroid protection, and that's the white suit, but we'll see that in a sec. But the big thing, when we were walking in space for the first time, one guy came this close to dying, Gene, uh, 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 Gene Cernan, who ended up walking on the moon in Apollo 17, trying to do, trying to first walk in space, having nothing to hold on to, really no training as far as what to expect. You're bouncing around, you're fighting with this big hose, and now I have to go and put on a jet pack and fly around like it's nothing. I can't even get to the end of the spacecraft. And he horribly overheated. They were, and seriously, they were getting very close to deciding whether they should just cut the hose and let him go because he wasn't going to survive. This was a scary, scary thing. And a large part of his problems were that he was totally, totally overheated. He couldn't see. His whole faceplate was all fogged up. So now you're seeing their panic. You have no idea which way is up. No one can see you. There's no television. Where am I going? How can I get the heck back into the spacecraft? It's panic time. It is serious, serious panic. We got to fix this problem. First major issue. I'm overheating. How do you fix that? Turns out we use it in NASCAR today. You get a suit, small undergarment, all that meshy kind of material. And I don't know how well you can see it. Probably want to come up later. But you notice that it's nothing but it's Tigon. You know, like you can get it at Home Depot. Tigon tubes that are circulating cold water, taking all the heat away. Goes to a heat exchanger, gets dumped outside. But there's no reason anymore to overheat. Inside a NASCAR, you'll get to about 140, 150 degrees in the cabin. That's not really good. So they all wear these kind of vests. If you have someone coming in to a hospital, they have these kind of vests, liquid-cooled garments. Absolutely milestone thing to get you. And you can see, you can see there's an attachment on your hip. It comes up, it connects to hoses. Water goes in and out. This was a breakthrough. This was huge. And that little garment that you saw, okay. We started out with all kinds of rubber bags. It turns out that's probably one of the most sophisticated things. You have about 30, 25 layers. You have a little inside, little nylon trico, uh, soft fabric, just because it's rubber, it's the next layer. Nylon, uh, rubber impregnated nylon. But then you've got to keep yourself cool. Remember, it's a couple hundred degrees outside in the sun. It's a couple hundred degrees below zero in the shade. You need real insulation. There is a marvelous, marvelous space insulation. Only works in a vacuum. Absolutely brilliant. You see it everywhere on spacecraft. If you have mylar, and you know mylar from balloons, there's also another marvelous super duper space age material called Kapton. Kapton is used everywhere. It's used for wiring, it's used for whatever. And if you get a sheet of Kapton and mylar and you put just a whiff of aluminum on it, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, little spacers in between, that is probably some of the most fabulous insulation you could ever have. And so you're wrapped in insulation. The real problem, you hear, oh, it's a couple hundred degrees below zero. Remember, you're in an airtight suit. Your problem is overheating. And so this kind of super insulation combined with the liquid cooling, you're comfortable, absolutely comfortable. And 
unfortunately, dummy me, I didn't even think of it until I was just saying it. I have uh, an example of Kapton Mylar insulation. If you see sp uh, pictures of a spacecraft and it looks like it's, oh, that's all gold, well, it turns out Kapton is gold colored. And it looks shiny because of that layer, just a, a, a microns thin of aluminum. It actually is, you know, I want to use it to wrap presents or something because it is kind of cool. But you have a whole bunch of layers of that, fabulous insulation, all your spacesuits are covered. That's why they're actually kind of bulky. Well, I mean, we saw that this is kind of bulky too. He's probably wearing his liquid garment underneath this. You know, you take a look at some of the folk, especially you take a look at some of the astronauts. Let's put it this way. I probably weigh 50 pounds, and of course a lot short. There's a skinny guy in there. A real skinny guy. So, we have all these different layers. But what's the hardest part of making the spacesuit? Gloves. Gloves. Toughest thing. Remember I was saying, you know, you take a glove and you... <laughs> Where's my hand? How do you maintain pressure on a concave surface? I mean, you're your rubber glove will want to expand out. I need something to grip. If it's expanded out, I can't do much with that, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Here's your cross-section of uh, the Apollo suit. You see the uh, coveralls on the outside. Uh, it is tough to move around in that. But they have films when they were working on these things. They actually have a bunch of guy in training suits playing football. Now, it weighs 40, 50 pounds, but then again, with the NFL, it's probably 40 pounds a gear anyway. And yeah, you have mobility. This was the breakthrough thing. And it was, they said it wasn't uncomfortable. Space shuttle, this is the latest and greatest iteration of what pilots use when they do very high altitude flights, like the U-2, the SR-71. Uh, these are still used today. They have little modifications for the shuttle versus the airplane but they're effectively the same. And you can survive forever in them. They're all pressurized, you can't go outside though. I Sir? I have a question about, um, two questions about the Kapton. Is that the same sort of gold shoe that they, you see when, they, when they're making satellites? That's exactly the same. Okay. And I should bring in my Kapton, because it's actually, again, it, it's, it, it's amazing stuff. It is quite pretty when you see it. You know, it's a, a golden, Trans, uh, uh, almost a transparent gold, but uh, color, and it's not gold, it's, that's just a natural color, but if you put the aluminum on it, it just like becomes almost iridescent. And it's very good at reflection. And also the, the liquid, the water cooling couldn't, because it's negative 200 degrees on one side, couldn't just the water circulate around from the, the spot you have? You're so light. super insulated, you don't see those temperature differences. Now, there is issues, and we could go in, and I had slides and I'm not gonna show them, um, that if you're in freezing cold for a long time, yeah, uh, you're going to have problems. And the guy that was the first one to work on repairing the Hubble telescope, Story Musgrave was in, uh, he almost lost all of his fingers because all of his fingers up, got frostbite in a vacuum chamber. Uh, and that's one of those things, I mean, how much can you insulate your fingers and still be functional? It's one thing, about, about, what do you call it? I, I think, again, Playtex gloves or something. He says you could pick up a dime. Yes, if you're old enough to remember that, we won't discuss that. Now imagine something that has to have all these different layers to it. Can you still pick up a dime? You're lucky to hold on to something. And again, remember, if the thing is expanding that way, how do you hold on? How do you make something maintain pressure that's concave? Tough one. You put the glove in, you got your hand like this, and then pull it back out. Don't you wish? The spacesuits that we use to walk in space for both the station and on the shuttle were, were functionally the same, very, very different. But they've got a neat construction. They really do. We think of it as a suit you put on just like you put on a flying suit or whatever, whatever. It's a little bit different. All the same constructs. You have a liquid-cooled garment. You have your backpack with your oxygen and things to circulate. Dump all that excess heat outside. You know how you dump out heat? Need a little heat exchanger. Now you can radiate things away, you know, on a big panel, but you don't want to do that. It turns out there's a little heat exchanger cooling loop. 
When they talk about needing water, when you spacewalk, yeah, you're thirsty. But what happens, remember how we were able to boil water at, you know, when it gets low and lower in pressure? When you get down below a certain point, it just goes right to ice and vaporizes. And that heat of, uh, and that heat of formation is a huge amount of heat. You circulate your warm water in a closed loop. Then you put it through this sublimator that you're pushing water through. That's warm, quote, quote, warm steam, water vapor, and it carries away all your heat. They use it on spacesuits. That was actually the constraining thing in Apollo 13, was there water for sublimation, not for drinking. Interesting pieces of trivia. So, how do you get the heck into a spacesuit? Okay, so you got your, your liquid garment, you have all your hoses and all the rest, you can see that. And you got a pair of pants. This is what's called the neutral buoyancy laboratory. This is where they train. And, well, you gotta get dressed. Gotta get ready for work. And so, okay, they lay it out and get your pants on. Well, how about putting on your shirt? We'll call it a shirt, it's not, but okay. Well, the, the top part, which also has your backpack connected, is a little bit different. You know, that's just lots and lots of layers of fabric and a gas bag and all the rest. But it turns out you have a hard shell and you don't put this on. They say basically you screw yourself into it because it's rigid, it's all fiberglass, has lots of insulation, but it doesn't matter, you're fighting that. And yeah, it's like, remember, you know, trying to dress kids? Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. And yeah, you don't go into that easily. You screw yourself in, and voila, you're ready to go. This is what's called the hard up, upper torso. This now has all of your controls, it's all fiberglass. You actually float around inside it and bounce around and all the rest, but there's nothing really on your chest that you need to bend. As a matter of fact, working on the space station or shuttle, there isn't even really any need to bend at your waist. Walking on the moon, they certainly had to do that. You know, they were sitting on rovers, they had to bend down to get samples. No need to. So it's okay that you're kind of pressurized like this. You don't use your legs very much. It's not like swimming where you're kicking to get yourself around. Actually, you notice for all that time in the water, You'll see if you watch a lot of space, uh, uh, spacewalk films, the old habits die hard. You'll see them trying to kick because that's the way it was when they were training. So, gloves. It turns out this is such a big deal. NASA has, and they run it every couple of years. Last one, I think, was five or six years ago. They send a challenge out to every university, every student group, every, every. And it's $100,000 prizes. This is serious stuff. And they call it the glove challenge. The most miserable thing, and anytime, you know, like when I'll do NASA events and all the rest, we have a vacuum chamber with a glove in it. And that glove is almost impossible to move in. And that's not even real, real pressure like what these guys do. You can always tell someone who's training for a, a, a spacewalk. Always has tennis balls to exercise their hand. No sense of feeling, or very, very little. And now you have to build a space station, service a couple billion dollar Hubble telescope, work with screws that are about that big. You gotta keep the gas in, then you have to restrain yourself. All that Playtex pick up a dime, uh-uh. You see that there's little convolutes on there, so at least you can bend. Doesn't work all that well. But then again, you have to, remember the glove blowing up? It turns out there's actually a little metal bar in the palm that keeps it so you could grasp onto things. It, you know, it, it's designed in that way, and it, it, it's workable. And then you have to have that thermal insulation, also protects against meteoroids coming and blowing your hand into a million pieces. So that's, that's a tough thing. And every couple of years, there's one smart engineer who turned out his folks work in a fabric house. And he, did, he was the winner of a couple of years ago. And, it, and they are good. 
and they're taking ideas and all the rest. So this is real, both practical engineering and public outreach. And if you want to make a quick hundred grand, and this guy spent a year or two on this, so it's not quick. But design a glove. All right, we're not going to say pick up a dime, but yeah. Design a glove that's practical. I'm sorry? Oh, well, we were playing cards today. We couldn't pick up the cards off the table because yeah. the house is so dry. Yeah. Now try, try doing that in a space glove. And if you get a chance to go to, the, uh, well, usually we run lots of exhibits where we have a pressurized glove. You're actually putting it into a, 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 a vacuum chamber, or a, a much reduced chamber. It is really tough. Now try working for eight hours with little screws. All of a sudden you have a real appreciation. Again, guys are always going around squeezing tennis balls. Okay, Russians, we're, we're, we're just about done. We, we're doing this at Nana now. Anyway, so the Russians have their own way of doing things. I love the Russians. I mean, when you just think of different ways. It all works. Obviously, it works. They have two different kinds of suits. Like, we have those orange suits when you're launching, and then they have their spacewalk suits. But kind of, kind of different. This is their spacewalking suit. It's called the Orlon. An early one was called Cratchit. But, okay, it looks pretty much the same. Now, remember how we had to screw ourselves into the old one? Different, but it works. How do you think they get into that suit? Through the back. There's a door in the back. <laughs> it works. It works. You stick your feet down there, you pop your head up in the helmet, guy closes it, or he's got a little rope you can close and latch it. It works. It works fine. We will likely, and again, I'm, I, I could have gone on for hours on, on this whole topic and I had to cut it. Uh, we will likely do something very similar on Mars. And there's all kinds of conversations on that. That's offline, but yes. Do we share uh, the suit technology between the countries or do we uh, go our Well, we've had our designs for years and years and the Russians have had it for years and years and they both work. Is there a reason to change things up? Ooh. Uh, yes, we exchange everything. Uh, uh, Americans have used their suits. Obviously, when we go up to the space station on the Russian spacecraft, uh, we certainly obviously have to have, you know, we're using their suits. When the Russians were using the space shuttle, same thing. Occasionally, it says most of the time, I had to qualify it, most of the time, Russian spacewalks are done in Russian suits. American spacewalks are in uh, uh, American suits. Sometimes, depending on the situation, they'll change up. Americans will go out in Orlan and all the rest. So anyway, this is their suit that they use to get up and down on the Soyuz. And okay, nothing fancy or special. I think this part is fun. And we're going to finish up with this. Okay, Samantha Christofredi, she, she photo I think every moment of her life she was photographed. Um, this is her putting it on. Okay, there's a big opening. Pretty much from your chin all the way down to your crotch. And it's a big opening. Boy, this thing looks easy. We're just gonna go and put our feet in. Flip over the top. That's a heck of a big hole, isn't it? And so, yeah, you're getting yourself in. It's like being born in reverse. And, yeah, that's an awful lot of excess material, fans. What do you think you do with that? And you go, oh, there's got to be a big zipper or something. Believe it or not, there's some, uh, the Apollo suits and most of the others all have very airtight zippers. I didn't think there was such a thing, but there is. Again, we could spend an hour on just zippers. So what do you think you do with all that excess material? Got to be a zipper. Maybe they super glue it. God knows what. Thoughts? Ideas? Tuck it in. Wrap it in film. A rubber band. You gather it all up, and there are people who specialize in putting that rubber band on just right. Like a belly button. Yeah. And then you stuff it in your suit and you zip up. That's how the Russians do it. What's wrong with that? Nothing. It's worked for 20 years. It works like a champ. 
I never would have thought of that. But that's how they do it. And so, yeah, you just gather it up and there's standard Mark I Mod Zero, probably a $500, rub well, it's Russian, so it's 500 whatever uh, dollar rubber bands. And you just tuck it in, zip up, and you're done. Again, you think of that and it's like, that's crazy. Well, it works. Again, it's worked for them for 20 years. They have like a, a rubber band man who comes by. Oh, yeah. No, no. They have a guy whose job is to make certain rubber bands are fine. Of course, he doesn't go up. But yes, ma'am. Is each astronaut suit uh, crafted for that astronaut? With the spacewalking suit, you have the arms and legs, to ta or, 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 the arms and the boots to attach. And you can get large, small, medium, all the rest. Because, you know, you figure a small woman or a big guy, they're going to, I mean, there could be six inches difference in, in your height, you know, some cases. Um, they do come in sizes. The uh, orange suits are, are more military issue. I mean, obviously much more. And they come in sizes. But you see some of them like, a, 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 oh, if you look at some of the cockpit shots, you see some of these folk, and the suit's a little big, and so the, the neck ring where the helmet attached come up, you know, all you can see are their eyes. But remember, you grow in space. You can grow maybe an inch, inch and a half. By the time they come down, their eyes, you know, it's not coming up to here, it's coming like whatever, you have to accommodate for that, because you're not gonna get someone resizing your suit. They have to, they have to take that into account? Oh, very much. Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, on the second moon landing, um, P. Conrad, the commander, actually had didn't get any sleep on the moon because they spent the night relacing, rebuilding their spacesuit because you know he was a little run of a guy, but he grew an inch, and he said you know by the uh, after his first moonwalk, you know his his shoulders were being cut because it was so tight, and so he had to let the boots out. So he could stand up. It was very, very painful. And so, yeah, the first overnight on the moon, they were sitting there pulling laces out and reconfiguring the suits. This is the Mars suit. We're pretty much done. Uh, all those problems we have have to be addressed. It was one thing to weigh, uh, wear 180 pounds of spacesuit and backpack on the moon because it was only 30 pounds on Earth, or 30 pounds on the moon, 180 pounds on Earth. Mars gravity is twice that, a little bit more. Imagine doing eight hours of work wearing, you know, 80 pounds of, of suit. We have to do better. So, and, oh, the bio suit. Yes, we're going to finish with this. Has anyone seen this, the bio suit? MIT uh, researchers were talking about, uh, were doing this about five, seven years ago. Out of amazing science fiction or some of those fantasy things, you know, where you have all the scantily clad women and all the rest. Boy, doesn't that look great. She needs a gun. Oh, yeah, yeah, completely. That's Dava Sorbel. Not Dava Sorbel, Dava uh, Newman. Um, she's the MIT professor. And, boy, she looks great. She's a triathlete. It's probably the best one to model it. But that is actually a very sophisticated concept and a very old concept. You see a lot of this stuff, and they talk about this is the next generation spacesuit. That's a lot of hooey. It's advertised as a spacesuit. Remember that one suit that we saw with all the pressure that was put on you? That's what it is. All this is, and these have to be made really individually for each person. This is a skin-tight suit, and they have found materials in those red whatevers that will start exerting the pressure. You don't have to have all those fancy hoses. You still have to have a helmet. You still have to have, you know, like flying boot gloves. It would, uh, in the preliminary work that they're doing, this actually works very well. They haven't done a full range of testing, but you will see this a lot. And it's like the next generation. It is not, sort of. A gas bag suit is probably the way to go because, gee, that's all nicely skin tight and boy, does that look sharp. And if I look that good, I'd wear it, I'd wear it every day. 
You see any thermal insulation? You see any thing to keep you cool, like that liquid garment? This addresses none of it. Protect from, from uh, micromedias? No protection whatsoever. You know, it's a skin tight bodysuit with some incredible materials that will shrink down, exert the pressure. This has a huge amount of really good engineering and science behind it. But that's all it is. It is a light years ahead version of that counter pressure suit that we saw from the 50s. Uh, no, blah, 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 you have to have life support. You will see a phrase, lines of non-extension. It turns out, you know, as I move and all the rest, some parts of my skin don't stretch or contract. And if you can exert on those lines, and they are basically, they are, those are the lines. Like if I move my arm, this is not expanding or contracting around certain x -ray. This has brilliant, wonderful engineering behind it. It does. As a practical spacesuit, no. And remember, you still have to pressurize your head and get oxygen in you. And there we are. Again, what the best dressed astronaut wears. We can talk. And we're actually, we're not terribly bad on time. Let's chat. Oh, come on. You wanted to talk about... Uh, Apollo 1, I mean. Yes. Apollo 1 was a horrible tragedy. Of course, we lost three astronauts in a, a pre-flight test. Uh, the t one of the many tests that they wanted to do was pressurize the cabin to make certain it was airtight. Um, uh, it was 100% oxygen at rather high pressures, about 18 PS, 17 and a half PSI. At that pressure, pure oxygen doesn't let things burn. They basically explode. And there was a spark, there was some coolant leaking, and the whole thing went up in seconds. They had no chance. They died from smoke inhalation, not burns. The suits were burned through, again, things, metal will burn in that. There was effectively no protection. What they did, because now all of a sudden they're just beside themselves, uh, they had, remember that picture of Ed White? Walking in space, that, those were the suits they were using. They weren't the modern Apollo ones. Uh, the Apollo spacesuits, that fancy material that they have on the outside, which is uh, Teflon impregnated uh, 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 fiberglass, they call it beta cloth, uh, that's very fireproof. If they were wearing the modern Apollo suits, they might have lived. We don't know that. But they were much more fire resistant than what they were wearing. But if they had smoke inhalation, Suit, would that, would help oh, the smoke inhalation was because the suits burned through. Okay. Now, to prevent that uh, or li uh, limit it, the problem is oxygen under very high pressure. Apollo was launched with a uh, not quite Earth level ni uh, nitrogen oxygen. I think it was like 30, 40 percent oxygen and the rest nitrogen. And they vented it all out when they depressurized, uh, they started going up in orbit. Here's your problem, and I wasn't going to talk about this. Okay, here I am walking around, for, my, my absolutely favorite, 14.7 PSI. Now I'm bringing it down to three and a half. It turns out nitrogen just loves the human body. You go up down to 3.5 PSI, guess what happens? you get the bends. It is the exact same situation as when you're a diver going down, getting saturated, and then coming up, and it does kill you. Tragically, many people do die. Hopefully, fewer and fewer. Uh, Mike Collins, Apollo 11. He apparently, you know, and of course, because of this, you see the guys going out the launch pad and, you know, with the spacesuits on and all the rest, and they're carrying a little what looks like an air conditioner. They're breathing pure oxygen to just get all that nitrogen out of them. Some people take longer than others. Mike Collins turns out got minor cases of the bends on his space flight in his knees. Says it was horribly painful, but you know that's the price you pay for being an animal. They knew exactly what it was, but uh, and it's all written up nicely in his book. I mean, he was miserable for a day or two until all the nitrogen outgassed. 
But uh, that's a real problem. It's why Apollo, we think of, oh, well, why don't we have a normal sea level air mixture on Apollo? You're going in and out of your spacecraft a couple times over a couple days uh, to walk on the moon. If you have to go and get all that nitrogen out of your blood so you can get in your spacesuit, because you can imagine if it's tough enough, if you're like this at three and a half, four PSI, doing it at 15, you are completely immobile. You're not going to be able to do fancy stuff on the moon. So uh, a large part of it wasn't, you know, with, with low pressure oxygen, the fire hazard is far, far less. Uh, but you need to have about a day or so to get the nitrogen out of your body and flush it out. And that's really it. When the, the space station or on the space shuttle, which has a normal earth oxygen, nitrogen thing, uh, if you're going to go spacewalking, you have to spend a day with a mask on and just breathing pure oxygen to get all your nitrogen out. Because you will get the bends. So why do they have nitrogen on the space shuttle? Because pure oxygen over a very long time is not the best thing for your body. And, you know, uh, oxygen, there's lots of science behind lower pressure um, atmospheres and it's the effect on the body. There's also an issue of 100% oxygen for a long, long time. And this is stuff that's been known for decades. And so the most accommodating environment is what we're doing right now because, by God, we're walking and talking. But, uh, so the oxygen after a while will, will, is bad for you? Pure oxygen, especially higher pressure, like you hear of nitrogen narcosis, mm -hmm. you have too much. Uh, uh, the, the Navy actually knows quite a bit about this uh, for their diving mixtures and all the rest. And if you're breathing under high pressure oxygen, you know, diving, say your mixture, your fancy technical diving uh, mixtures are wrong. Uh, yeah, you can go into seizures, you can do all kinds of things. I mean, it's not crazy. With, with pure oxygen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I figured it would be something like on the ISS, if, uh, pure oxygen, you, you lower pressure over a longer period of time, will oxygen, will oxidize something? Will... No, again, it's more of, you know, just how your body okay. handles it. I've been doing all the talking. You guys need to pipe up. We're asking you questions. All right. How about the gallery over here? You didn't talk at all about uh, protecting your against uh, radiation in the suits. Is that part of <sighs> There isn't much radiation protection in those suits. Uh, at the same time, especially for where the space station and the shuttle uh, operate, there isn't that much radiation, honestly. Uh, everyone goes, oh my God, the radiation is going to fry you. No. Um, and there's a wonderful website you can get to uh, uh, called Space Weather. Um, NASA uses standards similar to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about overall full body radiation doses. Um, you can fly for a couple years on the space station before you hit that limit. You know, we had Mark Kelly up there, I'm sorry, Scott Kelly up there for, uh, you know, a year, and he had already done six months plus other missions. Uh, and the, the metric that they're using is once you get to a certain, actually quite small, increase in your chance of having cancer. We're not talking about walking in space and getting fried and you die two days later. Nothing, nothing like that. Even going to Mars, the radiation is that you will never fly in space again because you've hit those limits. But honestly, time and time again, we have radiation monitors on, on the rovers and all the rest. It is not a great thing, but you are not going to get fried and die. You will probably want to visit, you know, your doctor regularly once a year, but uh, it's not like, oh my God, I've just stepped into a toxic cesspool and I'm, you know, anything like that, nothing like that. But I thought the magnetosphere protects us from... Radiation. And that's why you can be on the space station much, much longer than, say, a mission to Mars. Okay. ISS is quite a, a low orbit still inside. Yeah. Much of us protection. Okay. 
Yeah, there's only one spot where it, it really starts getting nasty, South Atlantic anomaly. It turns out, this is a great thing I found out not that long ago. We think of, like, we see the picture of the radiation belts and the magnetic fields. It turns out, you, know, you look at it and you go, oh, well, there's the center of the Earth. It all comes out from there. No. It's actually, I think, pushed more toward, the center of all of this stuff is more toward China. The radiation belts actually go down in the South Atlantic, uh, around South America. And, you know, if the ball is here, if the Earth is my thumb, it's actually shifted a bit. And so, uh, so the big worry is when you go through South Atlantic anomaly, uh, it's something that's been known for 50 years, and if you try taking a picture with the Hubble, it'll, it will not be ruined, but you'll see lots of cosmic ray, uh, not cosmic ray damage, you'll see radiation damage on those pictures. Very well understood. There isn't much you can do about it. And we're talking needing tons of shielding. So. And that's the other thing. A, a thin metal shield, and I don't remember exactly which particles are involved, but thin metal shield will make it worse because as the solar wind or other high energy particles hit it, it will steal off something that's, that's actually worse for you. Yeah. Body. It cascades, you know, uh, other particles, whatever. Now, with uh, the lower energy stuff, like say coming from the sun, which is not low energy, but relative speaking, uh, the uh, magnetic field will protect you pretty well. The stuff that you have no protection against is what we call galactic cosmic rays. And those are everywhere. Those get right through all that. They're not charged, so they're not affected by whatever. Those are heavy particles. And there isn't much you can do aside from launching in a block of lead and even then, you'd probably get the cascading shower of particles. Yeah. ISS has certain areas that are part of against uh, CMEs and other... Uh, yeah. Sun. But even, even so, CMEs, yeah, you, you want to go where the water storage is. Water is great. You can drink it, too, which has a double value. But, uh, yeah. But I don't think they've ever used it. Think of it as a storm shelter. Maybe, I, I just don't know that. I don't know that one way or the other. But uh, anything else? I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm here. There's a question about the ISS. Yeah. You talked about the ISS one or two times ago. And I'm thinking that if they they bring up they, they're they building the ISS and they'll park it. So when you say after a while, it's going to lose its capacity if it crashes. I'm sorry, again, please. Oh, sorry. You talked about the ISS before, how it was built in, in parts. And after a while, it's going to lose its usefulness and we're going to have to crash into the ocean. Mm -hmm. In 2029 or something? Uh, depending so. on certain administrations, so, we're not uh, going to put this in the political commentary. Uh, the current administration wants to dump it in the ocean in about four years. Why don't they do this? And that's that, uh, with the idea that we can do something else. <coughs> that's the uh, fallacy of assuming a zero sum world where, you know, if I don't have to spend money on it, SpaceX gets it, which is silly. But uh, do the same thing as we built it just take parts off one side, like, like my sense of Legos, and put parts on the other side. The problem is, the, uh, that's actually been somewhat considered. The oldest, I don't want to say the most decrepit parts, but the oldest parts uh, are the Russian segments. And you go, oh, well, we'll just take the Russians. If they don't want to play, they can take their toys. We'll just cut them off. It turns out the primary control for the station is in the Russian segment. So... And that is not 100% true, but it's true enough. There's the, there's the Russian segment, what's called the U.S. operational segment. They're independent and interdependent. And if, for example, you cut off just the Russian segment, because there's some great modern stuff up there. They're, they're still talking about adding another module to it uh, and then dumping it in the ocean two years later, which is insanity. Um, you would have to find a way to stabilize it, put like a some sort of temporary control, get rid of the Russian segment and all the rest. It is not designed, especially thermally, uh, to go anywhere but Earth orbit. If you wanted to use it, say, in orbit around the moon, for example, uh, or use it as what we, uh, what's been referred to as a deep space gateway, um, thermally it's not designed for that. 
Believe it or not, you can't have the space station in the sun all the time. As a matter of fact, it's so bad, uh, uh, you might know the phrase beta cutouts. Okay. Uh, it has to do with the angle of the sun in orbit and all the rest. And there are times in orbit when you're in the sunlight constantly. And they have real thermal issues. You have to adjust things. You can't have the solar panels looking. And if you're outside it, you could be in the sun the entire time. So it's one big beta cutout. Uh, it's a thermal issue amongst other things. And then you still have to supply, you know, but SpaceX and, you know, a couple other people can send supplies up, but now you have to send them to the moon, and they don't have the capability of doing that. So you can't just, like, have each little section, and as this section gets old, you put another section on this side. Like that? Or couldn't that be instead of destroying I, If you're going to do that, given the, given the... They should have thought about that 10 years Yeah, ago. given the amount of time you need to design, engineer... Define the problem you want. Uh, you should have started last year. I can't hear. There will be no follow-on station. I mean, that's not being crabby, but yeah, you know, there's nothing, nothing there. Uh, the next space station that is going to be assembled is going to have the Chinese flag on it. There are also going to be the next ones on the moon. In, in, in my speculative world, but the Chinese are going to dominate as far as, you know, long-term space flight after this. Russians don't have any money, and we don't have the political will. So, and the Chinese, you know, the Chinese landed on the far side of the moon a month or two ago. You go, how do you talk to it? Well, they had to put up a communication set. I mean, they're serious about this stuff. They are absolutely dead serious. Serious like a heart attack. Anything, I mean, we could, t I mean, again, I, I, I'm here all day, so. Any other thoughts or ideas or insanities or crazies or? Oh, anyway, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, we have that next month. It's a small world. For some reason, my, my niece was talking about going to Disneyland with her kids, and so I had to use that phrase. But uh, this is not all NASA. The Europeans and the Russians, well, maybe not so much the Russians, but the Europeans have been fabulous with this. Going and visiting the Japanese just landed uh, on an asteroid about three or four days ago. Uh, everyone is going to these small bodies. And we're going to be talking about it. So it's not going to be all what NASA is doing. Because the international community is doing fabulous things, and it is one of the things that we're looking at. Because you'll be able to see with the information that they get, what the beginnings of the origins of the solar system started with. Because these things are pretty pristine. They really are. And, yes, as I said before, dining in space. Please give some serious thought. Let us know if you're going to be coming so I, can, so I know how much to cook. Uh, this is going to be interesting. And again, this may blow up my face. And if so, well, no, I'll just take my leftovers, right? Uh, it's, it's, again, a tasting buffet, kind of like when you go to the supermarket and they have little tasty things. It's going to be a little more than that, but yeah, it, it's not like a buffet where you're going get, to get a plate and load up. Uh, but uh, we're doing this as an experiment. Sometimes experiments fail. I'm thinking it's going to actually work pretty well. And you're going to be surprised. And you get to try my turmeric chicken. Oh, 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 that's right. You're new here. Uh, we do these talks last Sunday of the month. And it's because my day job is, has me working two weekends a month toward the beginning of the month. And the only time I can be real, reasonably assured of not working is now. You know, uh, and depending on when you're on call, because we have a pretty rigorous on call thing, uh, it's about the only time in my other life that I can, I can make it. So, uh, whatever, the, if you have a calendar or something, whatever the last Sunday, same bat time. We might even open up a little early because we're going to have to set up and everything. Yeah, most of the time it's on the infoage.org. Yeah. Events. And uh, it'll all be Asbury Park Press, all the rest. Maybe I can get, maybe I can get the Asbury Park Press. Well, 
I thought, I thought they have a community events section. CoStar has it. Yeah, a lot of papers have it. I did it for a couple organizations. Yeah, and uh, you just go to events.app.com, and they'll put it in the paper, and it doesn't cost you a dime. And so, yeah, you know, uh, 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 as long as they spell our name right. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, over, you know, I live West Windsor, and we have a, one of those papers that you find in every restaurant called US One. And it's, I mean, it's you know, all the companies, and it's, there's, there's not a bit of substance to anything in it. But if you're wondering what's happening in the local area, remember the rock and roll papers when we were young? Uh, what was it, the Aquarian or Aquarius or something like that? Two or three, like, rock and roll papers and all the rest. Yeah, there's no real news in it, but you grab one off the, off the counter just to find out who's playing and whatever. These are what a lot of the uh, magazines or newspapers in the area are really for. Yeah, you're not gonna find scandals or you know, real insight or my next big investment tip. No, it's community events. And, that's, and they're pretty good like that. I don't know of the equivalent of this US one paper uh, that we have. And it's really only geared for 10 miles, 15 miles around Princeton. Uh, if what there is down here, and I've looked, I just don't know. But we put stuff in the Coast Star and the Asbury Park Press. And it is two of the times, Tri-City News, a couple of small things in Asbury Park. I do it for a couple of organizations mm -hmm. in my area. Mm -hmm. I was gonna talk afterwards. Like oh, that will be great, yeah. Out. I can, I do a blanket. Uh, press release for my area. Yeah. It's, it's doubled, well, sorry, by 20% I've increased the oh, yeah. Yeah. in uh, the organizations where I help. Like yeah, I well, the great thing is there's a bunch of new faces here, and, you know, it's interesting. This this month there's none of the regulars. There's like a half, like, you know, again, Jules and his daughter and a couple other folk aren't here, which surprised me, but oh well. I don't have, I'm running out of things to say, and aren't you glad? <laughs> I can't hear. What does ESA wear? What does? ESA, Europeans. Oh, what do they wear? Oh, uh, they wear you know, the Russian stuff going up and down. When they fly with us uh, during the shuttle era, they just wore what we wore. They did not have their own specialized suits. Okay. Yeah. Are suits reusable from mission to mission? Yeah, there is a lifetime, but uh, it's not like wear it once and throw it away. You know, some of those spacesuits have been up there for five or eight years. There is a lifetime. You know, again, one of the problems, you know what, you know what wears out? Rubber. And, you know, I think, do I have it? I probably don't. No. Ah, where is it? One of the great pictures, Smithsonian, of course. Let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that... Uh, the Smithsonian is always good at is preserving. And they're very, very worried about the idea that um, they're very worried about the idea that um, the Apollo spacesuits are all going to um, rot away. Yeah, here's the one. This and of course, to preserve things, they have to record everything they can about it. This is um, Al Shepard's uh, moon suit. And let's, see. oops, yeah. And that's what it looks like under the covers. And you can see where the oxygen comes in. You can see the venting hoses going around. You can see those accordion pleats in the arms and how they're restrained by cables. The zipper going up and down. It's a very fancy zipper, actually. Are you worried about preserving the suits? Oh, yeah. They're rotting out. Yeah, like when, I did, when I did the suit uh, uh, at uh, uh, Cradle of Aviation, that was in bad shape. Like, the, the zippers were almost immobile. Uh, again, it's, it's rubberized nylon, and rubber, you know, it's a natural thing, and it oxidizes, and it's starting to rot. It wasn't crumbly yet, but, uh, yeah. This is, there's actually a, 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 I don't like the idea that the Smithsonian, and I know it's semi-private, has to do a, a GoFundMe.
but they've raised, I think, either 100,000 or a quarter million to start preserving the suits. Because once they get to a certain point, you might as well just throw them out. And that's an exaggeration, but yeah, you see all the, God restrained those convolutes. It's a big problem in museums. Yes, huge one. And of course, you can see it's zippers. Very cool, I love this, these pictures. What else we got? Anything else? I mean, I don't want to keep you if you got you know, real things to do instead of listening to me ramble, but. So here's, a, here's, here's my question. Okay. Astronaut cookbook. Lots of recipes that are used and all the rest. I need to, I mean, I have a certain idea what I want to make. Thoughts about what you want to have? Oh, you'd almost have to. I mean, th this thing is, oh, uh, it's this well, much we, menus. We, we don't know yet, but we may suggest Well, I mean, suggestion. Food. Would you be more interested in main courses, desserts? Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, like dessert. Like, like, a, like, a, like, the, like the, uh, what's it, the, the, the tasting lady at Whole Foods. Yeah. The sample lady. You, you need a sample well, see, no, this is, this, is what, this is what we're trying to do. And it'll, it, uh, that's why I call it a tasting buffet, because... If you think of a buffet, you know, I know when I go to a buffet, my plate's like this, and that would feed a dozen people in my mind. It's, you know, toothpicks and like little spoons, and there might be enough for, you know, you know nothing that you're going to load up a plate. Not like, you know, a wedding buffet or anything like that. But what would, I mean, okay, like we have, what do we have here? Like a, like a little bit of breakfast, a little bit of lunch, and a little bit of dinner. Yeah, and it turns out a lot of the stuff... In, in certain ways, you're going to be disappointed. A large part of the way of describing it is camping food. And I'm going to have MREs. I'm going to have some dehydrated stuff that we'll have rehydrated. We'll have a microwave to warm things up, of course. Um, but in certain, I mean, coffee is coffee. We'll have, you know, coffee. Here. But uh, MREs, they, they give you little crack packs that heat up. We're not going to have those. Okay. And actually, in all the MREs I've gotten, no, I had to buy a separate one. Maybe, no, maybe I just... I guess that for him, for every, every, every birthday and stuff, it's uh, beprepared.com. Oh, okay, like, yeah. There's, like there's one company, company, actually, there's two companies that are the main military suppliers, which also supply NASA. Uh, and, you know, you can get them on Amazon. They're like seven bucks a meal, eight bucks or something. You don't want to what? You don't want to be in an enclosed environment with too much of the stuff. Well, they're all like totally sealed, so. Uh, the, the heaters. Right? Oh, yeah. oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of different things. But anyway, so let's oh, see what. Stuff. Pardon? On uh, the space, space station, how do you heat stuff? Using microwave? Because you don't have Do you remember when it was fashionable? Hold it outside. Yeah, what happens if you're on the cold side? On one side. You walk do you here. remember the old days? Because I knew people that had them, and yeah, some man of a certain age. When you had the aluminum briefcases, mm -hmm. yeah, some of us consider it, yes, we've now shown our age. What's that? <laughs> He's trying to be a smart ass. I don't know. Yeah, used to have these, you know, they were aluminum. My dad had one, aluminum briefcase. You have what looks, and you'll see pictures of it. You'll see an aluminum briefcase that has heating elements, and you just load up your stuff. Close it, you set the timer, and when it's all done, it's warm. And that's their heaters. How, but, how uh, pardon? Is it electric? Yeah, yeah. you plug it in. But uh, let's see what we got. We got uh, peach ambrosia, space, shuttle, uh, space station chicken noodle soup. Never a bad idea. Yeah. We, can, we can talk about that. Here's the recipe. And it's actually the recipes that they use because, for example, three teaspoon National 150 filling aid starch from National Starch and Chemistry. Oh, you call it cornstarch. This is, I mean, this is the level that they work at. And the, and the whole idea is that, oh, you're not going to go to the National Starch and Chemical Company. You're going to go to ShopRite and you're going to, you know, if you don't have cornstarch in your shelf already. Uh, 
what else is in here. This sounds interesting. Uh, they also got some celebrity chefs to uh, uh, contribute, and they flew this. Rachel Ray, taco chili mac and cheese. Emerald, bacon cheese match potatoes. And the, I have one small problem with this, but uh, Emerald's Mardi Gras jambalaya, and I love jambalaya. He's calling for duck. It's Emerald. Uh, but uh, yeah, I could, I, I do, trust me, I do a pretty good jambalaya at home. That sounds good. Uh, crab cakes. Lots of these are, lots of the recipes are donated by uh, uh, folks other have, spouses. Yeah. Spicy green beans. Yeah, spicy, uh, emerald spicy green beans with garlic. You mentioned uh, turmeric chicken before. That sounded interesting. Oh, I, I, I made that two weeks ago. And again, remember, it's this world-renowned Italian chef doing this. And I know it's nothing like whatever. But when was the last time you had nice turmeric uh, chi uh, uh, chicken with uh, compagnon mushrooms? Well, in two months, you won't be able to say that again. But uh, sandwiches, rhubarb salad. I've never been a fan of rhubarb. Uh, chicken noodle soup. Space Station shrimp cocktail. All right, we're just going to have a shrimp ring. But, um, get out of here and don't bother your time with me. Thank you so much.